What's up, biology students? Mr. Holloway here. In today's video, we're going to learn some more about chemical reactions, enzymes, and how enzymes help us to regulate the many chemical reactions upon which our lives depend. Unlike physical changes, in which the appearance of a substance may be altered, while the substance itself remains the same, chemical changes result in the production of a new substance that was not present before. For example, if you chop down a tree, that's a physical change because you started with wood and you ended with wood. All that changed was that you chopped this wood into smaller pieces. However, if you burn that wood in a fire, that's a chemical change because the wood is transformed into new substances. In this case, soot, ash, and carbon dioxide gas. In the end, what you are left with is not wood anymore. It's something else, and that's what makes burning something a chemical change. However, the wood in this example didn't just disappear. The atoms that make up the wood were rearranged and recombined with other atoms, and that's how new substances are formed. Since the atoms that make up the wood are not destroyed, but are simply rearranged, they have the same mass before and after the fire, and in that sense, matter is conserved. Energy is also conserved. As that tree was growing, it was absorbing the sun's energy in order to conduct photosynthesis and to produce carbohydrates. This same energy is released as heat when we burn the wood. Suppose that each ball represents an atom, and the letters tell us what kind of atom we have. In all these cases, you should notice that we end with exactly the same number and kinds of atoms that we started with. These atoms have, however, been rearranged and recombined. Take the last row, for example. We start with four atoms, A, B, C, and D, and end with four atoms, A, B, C, and D. However, these two molecules didn't exist before this reaction, and likewise, these two molecules no longer exist after the reaction. Atoms were rearranged, and we produced new substances, but if we took the mass of these and compared it to the mass of these, we would find these masses are equal. Our burning wood example was an example of a combustion reaction. This is also an example of a combustion reaction, but with much simpler molecules. Here we see what happens during the combustion, or burning, of methane gas. Methane is a form of natural gas, like propane, and is highly flammable. In the presence of oxygen, and with enough energy to start this reaction, maybe something like a spark or a flame, one methane molecule reacts with two oxygen gas molecules to form one atom of carbon dioxide and two atoms of water. We call the methane and oxygen gas molecules we started with reactants because they are the molecules reacting with one another. And we call the carbon dioxide and water molecules products because they are what is produced by this reaction. Compare the atoms we start with and the atoms we end with, and we find them to be exactly the same, both in type and in numbers. They have, however, been rearranged to form new substances. All chemical reactions require some input of energy to get started, and this energy is called the activation energy. In each of these graphs here, this big hump in the middle represents that activation energy, and the reaction won't begin until we give it enough energy to get over the hump. Kind of like rolling a ball up a hill. If we roll the ball fast enough, it will easily make it to the top of the hill, and we'll be able to continue rolling down the other side. If we roll the ball slower, it may not make it all the way up the hill, and may just roll back down to our feet. For our combustion reaction example, the activation energy came in the form of a spark or a flame, and that energy was sufficient to get over the hill and start the reaction. Once the reaction gets going, it either absorbs energy from the environment, or releases energy into the environment, quite vividly in this case. In this first graph, we see the energy involved in an energy-absorbing reaction. The reactants we start with have very little energy on their own. The products on the other side of this hump have more energy. Since energy is always conserved, that means that the difference in energy between the reactants and products had to come from the environment in which this reaction was taking place. An example of this kind of reaction is photosynthesis. The reactants of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water molecules, have very little energy of their own. But the products of photosynthesis, simple carbohydrates and oxygen gas, contain a lot of energy. This energy came from the sun, and the plants are essentially packaging the sun's energy into these molecules themselves, which is why we can consume carbohydrates in order to provide ourselves with energy. 
Another example of an energy absorbing reaction is the one that takes place inside of an instant ice pack. When you break the little pouch inside of an instant ice pack, two substances mix together, react, and absorb energy from their environment in order to keep the reaction going. This feels cold to us because the reaction is literally sucking the heat energy out of our body in order to push the reaction forward. Combustion, like we just talked about, is an example of a reaction that releases energy, and this kind of reaction is depicted in this second graph. In this case, the reactants that we start with contain more energy than the products we end with, and this difference in energy is released into the environment. In the case of combustion, we feel that release of energy as heat, which is why fire keeps us warm. Another example of an energy releasing reaction is cellular respiration, which is the reaction living organisms use to free up the energy stored in carbohydrates. So plants take the sun's energy and pack that energy into the carbohydrates they produce during photosynthesis, then all organisms, both plants and animals, use respiration to release this energy in a different form, one that can be used by living cells to do work that needs to be done. Respiration is actually very similar to a combustion reaction. In both cases, a carbon-based molecule reacts with oxygen, releasing energy and producing carbon dioxide and water. All chemical reactions require some input of energy in order to get started. Inside of our cells, protein molecules called enzymes help us to regulate the chemical reactions that support life. Enzymes act as biological catalysts, speeding up reactions by lowering the activation energy required for that reaction to get started. In this graph, we can see this illustrated to us. The blue line represents the progression of a chemical reaction that occurs without any enzymes around to catalyze this reaction. This high point on the graph represents the activation energy required to convert the reactants of this reaction into products. With an enzyme present, this high point is much lower, meaning the reaction requires much less energy in order to progress. Enzymes work by providing a location for specific reactions to occur. The reactants of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction are called substrates, and these substrates bind to the active site of an enzyme molecule with a complementary shape. These two pieces fit together like a lock and key, and this is why most enzymes only catalyze one particular chemical reaction. This combination of enzymes and substrate is called an enzyme-substrate complex, and once the reaction is complete, the products are released and the enzyme is ready to catalyze another reaction. The shape of an enzyme is what allows it to bond with a particular substrate in order to catalyze a chemical reaction, but large changes in temperature and pH can alter the shape of an enzyme and may prevent that enzyme from being able to function. This is like altering the internal structure of a lock. Once you do that, the key won't fit anymore. In proteins like enzymes, this change in shape is called denaturing, and is actually what happens when you cook an egg. The egg whites only become white when cooked, and this change in appearance and texture is due to the denaturing of proteins found in the egg whites. If you think back to the organic molecules we've learned about so far, the carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and proteins, you should recall that each of these molecules is metabolized in some way inside of our cells, meaning that these molecules are constructed, broken down, or maybe both. These are only a few examples of the many important chemical reactions that occur inside the cells of living organisms. When small molecules, or monomers, combine to form large molecules, or polymers, this is called dehydration synthesis. We call it a dehydration reaction because water is produced as a byproduct, as though water was removed from the smaller molecules, so we are synthesizing a polymer by removing a water molecule. This kind of reaction absorbs energy, and this energy is then stored in the chemical bonds of the large molecules produced. Dehydration synthesis is what occurs when combining glucose molecules in order to make starch or glycogen, and when combining nucleotides to make DNA, and when combining amino acids to build a polypeptide, and when attaching fatty acid chains to a glycerol molecule in order to make a lipid. In all cases, smaller pieces are being joined together to make a bigger molecule. But suppose we wanted to take apart that molecule of glycogen to release more glucose or blood sugar into the bloodstream. When the opposite process occurs, when large molecules are taken apart into smaller molecules, this is called hydrolysis. Hydro means water, 
and lysis means to split. So this reaction is essentially about splitting a molecule apart using water. This reaction releases energy, the same energy that was stored in the molecules involved when they were built during dehydration synthesis. This is another example of how energy may change form and location, but is always conserved overall. Energy goes into building the large molecules, and energy is released when that large molecule is taken apart. In our bodies, much of the energy that is released during our metabolism is the heat that keeps our bodies warm and helps us to maintain homeostasis. This is what makes us warm-blooded. Our metabolisms are working fast enough that we produce enough of our own internal heat to keep us warm. The same is not true of reptiles and amphibians, who metabolize much slower and who rely on external sources of heat to keep themselves warm and to maintain homeostasis. Enzymes help to catalyze these kinds of reactions. Here we see a depiction of a dehydration synthesis reaction. In this case, two amino acids are our substrates. Water is produced, that's the dehydration part, and a polypeptide is synthesized as a product of this reaction. This is how polymerization occurs, and monomers are combined to form a polymer with the assistance of enzymes. We've seen this figure before, but this is an example of a hydrolysis reaction in which a larger molecule, a polymer, is broken down into smaller molecules, or monomers. Sucrose is our substrate, and when water is added, that's the hydro part, sucrose is split apart, that's the lysis part, into a molecule of glucose, and a molecule of fructose. This kind of reaction would release energy into our cells, the same, energy that, the same energy that originally went into assembling that polymer in the first place. Life runs on chemical reactions. There are literally thousands of chemical reactions occurring inside your cells right now, many of which are being regulated by a wide variety of enzymes. These chemical reactions aid in digestion, waste removal, detoxification of hazardous substances, muscle movement, and brain and nerve activity, just to name a few. To understand our bodies and our health, we need to understand these chemical reactions and how they affect us. We also need to understand the enzymes that help us to regulate these reactions, as well as the factors that affect the enzymes themselves. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks again for watching, and remember that you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need to until you feel like you understand the concepts.